if you can use the chat function, that would be fantastic. And um, so welcome everybody to um, the third of our webinar series on the menopause. Um, tonight's, tonight's one is weight gain at midlife. Um, so uh, my name is Eleanor. My name is Eleanor and I am a director of Finesse, one of the directors of Finesse Movement in Maynooth. And at Finesse, we aim to have a positive impact on our clients' lives by helping them move pain-free, to regain and maintain pain-free movement for their activities of their daily lives. And we normally do this through reformer Pilates and physical therapy. And more recently, we've been doing it through uh, our webinars, um, this, like this webinar series. Um, our hope is that with the information we share, that women can make a more informed decision and choices when it comes to their healthcare and maybe maybe have a light bulb moment when it, when it comes to their health about what's actually going on for them. Um, so this evening, your presenter is Karen Murray. Um, her passion is to help other women navigate menopause and perimenopause. Um, she's also quite, quite fond of Pilates as well just a bit, <laughs> just a bit. Um, so and she loves having chats uh, with women about all things health but in particular menopause and perimenopause is, is very close to her heart at the moment given her recent experience um, through through that coming up to and entering into that phase of her life I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that herself through the presentation um, so this evening's information is hopefully going to explain why we as women tend to gain weight at midlife um, and help us figure out things that we can do to help maintain our weight and keep it at a good a good healthy level and um, while Karen isn't a nutritionist she has spent years researching good nutrition for health and wellness and has personally revolutionized my <laughs> my understanding of nutrition um, when I met Karen I was a chronic or serial yo-yo dieter. Um, I had been on that bandwagon, uh, paleo, Weight Watchers, Slim and World, all of those uh, kind of things. But Karen uh, has re-educated me uh, over the years uh, and shown me that there is lots of options to be, a bit, to be able to eat for your health and your wellness, as well as enjoying <coughs> wine and some chocolate crisps. Uh, so uh, in very moderation. in moderation, <laughs> uh, very balanced. And yeah. um, so she's, yeah, she's researched. She's um, one of these. She's got like little books filled with uh, cuttings of di uh, recipes and stuff that she's gathered over the years with little notes and, you know, how to change in all these recipes to make them super healthy and stuff. So she's got a really um, long standing interest in nutrition. Um, and so hopefully this evening you'll pick up a few tips, you'll learn a little bit more that will help make you make better choices for your own health. And um, like I said, if you have any questions, if you want to use the chat function, uh, fire ahead and we'll get to them probably at the end. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, my lovely wife, Karen Murray. <laughs> I'll scoot you away from your foot. Foot goes. This is the hot seat. Okay, well, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Um, as Eleanor said, and thank you for the lovely introduction, Eleanor, I'm Karen. Um, and I'm delighted to see so many familiar faces this evening and also some new ones. So you're all very welcome as well. Um, this has been a huge week uh, for menopause care in Ireland um, with the Joe Duffy show uh, dedicating seven seven of its shows to the topic of menopause. Um, it gave thousands of women a, the perfect platform to tell their stories, and some of which were really very harrowing. But it wasn't only Ireland who burst open the floodgates. They did in the UK too, where Davina McCall last night told her own menopause story, um, along with seven others on a Channel 4 documentary. Um, there was one very startling figure given, I couldn't believe it, um, out of, uh, a 14 million population of women over 45 years and up, only one in 10 of those women are on HRT. Um, now, this isn't a talk about HRT, but uh, it is good to know, you know, what those sort of figures are like. And Davina did mention that it wasn't, you know, some of the reasons um, were mainly 
that it was a personal choice, but also a awful lot of those reasons were down to education that they just didn't know. They just didn't know what they didn't know. Um, and that just seems to be the overarching uh, feeling that you know has kind of come about over the last week. And for myself personally too, I didn't know what I didn't know. And um, I could talk to you all night about my boring journey to uh, being diagnosed with perimenopause, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so there is a feeling out there across social media in particular, that the tide is turning um, and some positive outcomes will undoubtedly come through this awareness campaign. But we all need to do our own little bit uh, in helping that too. So we need to raise awareness ourselves in our own lives um, just by talking to our spouses, educating our children. My, my uh, almost 13 year old daughter was watching uh, part of it, <laughs> not all of it, but she, she watched about the first 15 minutes of it. Um, and it's just important. It's just important just to normalize this. You know, it happens to 51% of the population, uh, you know, so at some stage in their lives. Um, and it is important because, you know, there needs to be adequate care and education for women to navigate this stage of their lives. So with that in mind, um, the purpose of tonight and the purpose of uh, this evening's talk is to take a look at weight gain around perimenopause and menopause inform you of these changes, what causes them and how to manage it going forward. Um, in my own personal experience, so from what I've noticed in my own, my own body in person um, and also from the research that I've been doing for the last number of months and over a year, um, there seems to be two main issues at play. So it's weight gain and a change in our body composition. So moving on, where will I go? Click, do I need to click? Mike. Yeah, no. Thank no, you. Thanks. So I do need to click. <laughs> okay, weight gain in midlife. <laughs> She's meant to be in my IT department and uh, it's not happening. No, it's not happening. No. <laughs> there we go. Um, so what we're going to touch on this evening is what factors influence weight gain in midlife? Um, is it just down to perimenopause and menopause or is it plain old aging? Uh, the role of hormones in weight gain. Uh, can everyone see my screen actually? So, yeah, sorry, I should have done that. Oh, yeah, yeah? Yeah. yeah, just brilliant. Okay, thank you, Maeve. Um, the role of hormones in weight gain, um, the lifestyle, lifestyle changes, and then management of weight gain. And the most important thing I think is where to go from here. Um, so what causes weight gain? Well, research suggests that weight gain may be due more to aging than it is to the loss of oestrogen, uh, which seem to have been you know, quite at play. Um, lean body mass decreases in both men and women due to changes in hormones. So, you know, we don't, we're not just uh, the ones that are losing hormones, men lose um, their testosterone too. Uh, there's an increase in more of a sedentary lifestyle as you get a bit older. A loss of muscle mass, so this is huge, um, results in a slower metabolism um, or BMR. So I'm gonna, re I'm gonna refer to metabolism, I'm gonna interrelate them. So it's BMR or metabolism, but it's basically the rate at which we burn calories. Your BMR is an estimate of the total calories burned a day while in the state of rest. So it's if you lay in the bed all day long and drank tea, you know, how many calories do you burn doing that? So it's what actually you have to have in your body that is gonna keep you alive. Um, physically inactive people can lose as much as three to 5% of their muscle mass each decade after the age of 30. So, you know, there's a correlation between your loss of muscle mass, your lower metabolism, you know, rising in weight gain. So there was a highly regarded piece of research um, done in the US, and it's the study of women's health of the nation. It's a, uh, or otherwise known as the SWAN study. Let's see, I can't see that. It is a long, uh, it's a longitudinal study of over 3,000 ethnic, ethnically diverse women in the US. Um, and it was designed to examine physical, biological, psychological, and social changes. It included weight and body composition trends during the menopause transition. Um, and the study reported a two to 2.3 kilo gain over a three year follow up during this menopause transition. So an increase in weight, particularly abdominal weight has been linked to hormonal changes during the menopause. 
once estrogen declines, there is a sharp shift in the rate at which we use energy. <clears throat> so prior to menopause, fat would tend to be stored around our bum and thighs. We're all familiar with this, giving us more of a pear shape, uh, all thanks to the wonderful presence of estrogen. Uh, and without it, we see what we see happening is more of an apple shape. And when it comes to weight loss, restrictive and fad diets really don't work. And we all know this, you know, you go on this absolute torturous weight loss um, diet, you know, for two weeks or whatever, and you, you feel starving and defeated and you feel rubbish. I forgot my L and my rubbish. Um, and then this whole vicious cycle of binge eating, guilt and shame attached with that. And then it just kind of goes around and around and around. And in an awful lot of times you end up actually losing uh, or putting on more weight um, that you've actually lost. Um, so all the while then for us midlife women, we're still trying to cope with other symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. So a better approach would be to focus on nourishing your body with wholesome food. Um, what's going on there? Sorry, I have somebody. So the idea would be to work on some lifestyle changes and I'll go into these uh, in a little bit better detail. Um, in future slides. Uh, most importantly, <clears throat> address your homo hormonal imbalances, regardless of whether you decide to go down the route of HRT or not. So let's talk about estrogen. So estrogen is made in the ovaries um, and we've estrogen receptors throughout every cell of our bodies, um, from our brain to our guts. We've all, we've all probably heard like, you know, this brain gut or gut brain access. So it is very important. Um, when our bodies start to recognize these declining levels, they try to obtain the estrogen from a, the, from a different source. So estrogen then is produced by the fat cells because it's been declined in other areas of our body. Um, and that's why many women will see an increase in abdominal fat, the muffin top, the spare tire, just the bane of our lives. These changes can lead to a bigger problem though of metabolic complications. Um, such as type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease if left unaddressed. And lower levels of estrogen can often cause joint pain. So in my own experience, that definitely was one. And, you know, if you're suffering from joint pain or muscle stiffness, the last thing you want to be doing then is going out and exercising. So that's also going to have an impact then on your weight gain. It can also cause problems with sleep due to hot flushes and night sweats. So testosterone, uh, testosterone is another important female hormone, which uh, I didn't know um, we had. And we actually produce three times more testosterone in the ovaries than we do estrogen. I mean, who, who knew that either? Um, so it is very much a female hormone. And quite recently online and social media, I've been hearing women tell stories of going to doctors and they're refused testosterone. Um, because you know they just don't feel that they need it, um, but this will tell you why you do need it. Uh, levels of this is, of this hormone start to decrease in our thirties, and decreased levels have an impact on our muscle mass. Uh, therefore, that results in our metabolism and also getting lower, and then also lower energy levels. And low levels of testosterone also have an impact in our libido and our cognitive function. So brain fog that can be a huge symptom for women. And it certainly was for me. And I don't know if some of my clients are actually here. That was, I think Maeve, you could have been in that class that time. Um, so I, you know, I teach Pilates in, in finesse and uh, I was teaching these women I know very well. And I knew exactly what my class plan was and I was teaching away and we were moving to the next exercise. And I literally went blank. I could not think of what the next exercise was. I just went blank and I went, um, but my clients were so lovely that, you know, I didn't even know that it was, a, it was brain fog. I just didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. So um, 
I just kind of made a, a, a sort of a joke and said, oh, I think I might be perimenopausal. Um, and we moved on because I remember the next exercise. But yeah, things like that, you know, you, you just you don't remember people's names that you know on a regular basis or meet on a regular basis, your work colleagues. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible symptom to have. Stress and insulin uh, resistance as well. So this comes hugely into play with our hormones. So we have two nervous systems, a sympathetic uh, system and a, a parasympathetic system. So this is our fight, flight and freeze response. And it's hugely uh, supported by estrogen. And low levels can trigger a stress um, resulting in obviously then adrenaline and cortisol uh, coming through. And adrenaline, we know the symptoms, they're increased heart rate, breathing rate, a dry mouth, you know, things that are getting me through this presentation right now. <laughs> Um, and butterflies in your stomach. Cortisol causes the body to release glucose because that is that, fl uh, that flight uh, response um, for that burst of energy to allow people to flee the situation. So a lot of people use the, the example of the saber-toothed tiger out in, um, out in the wild and you need to get the hell out of there. So that burst of uh, energy is your cortisol going into your body um, through the release of glucose. So when this glucose is not used for that physical activity, it triggers the release of insulin, which then metabolizes the glucose away as fat. So can you imagine if you're, I mean, we're all very uh, stressed people. We live in a very stressed society. Um, so can you imagine that you're, you're having this cortisol uh, response um, numerous times a day and nothing's happening? This glucose is going into your into your system, but you're not doing anything with it. It's just you're getting stressed. So it does have to go somewhere. And it goes because it's not being used physically. It goes on as fat. Um, Elmer keeps playing with the mouse. I'm just going to have to take it off her, I think. So chronic, this chronic stress can lead to something called insulin resistance, basically, where you know, you, you become uh, resistant to the insulin that's in your body. So your body then has to make more and more and more insulin to try and deal with this glucose. Um, and this usually results in fluctuations of blood sugars, which can lead to a higher risk of developing type two diabetes and heart disease. So, you know, you may have, you may have heard the term, it's like, a, it's a pre-diabetic. So that is what insulin resistance really is. Um, it can also be felt on your sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, which means that it will make it much harder to reduce menopause symptoms as well. Because you have less of them and anxiety can also manifest as, as, at night as well due to the cortisol imbalance. And that was something that happened to me. I didn't really don't really suffer from kind of sleep disturbance. But before I went on HRT, I'd have a. Uh, and I was like highly anxious. That was one of my biggest symptoms. Um, I'd wake up in the middle of the night uh, after having what I can't remember, but seemed like a nightmare. And I would just feel all this cortisol going around in my body. And I was scared to death. Uh, and it was a horrible, horrible feeling because obviously then how do you get back to sleep after that? You know, you're up and you're wired then for the rest of the day. Um, so we'll go on to hunger hormones. I don't know if any of any of you are familiar with leptin and ghrelin. So these two hormones are closely linked to weight. Leptin acts as an appetite suppressant and ghrelin as an appetite stimulant. So when there's increased fat in the body, um, this can cause leptin resistance um, because basically there isn't a signal getting to the brain to say that we're full. We just keep, you know, and so for people who are pretty much obese, that is a huge problem for them. Uh, and then on conversely, then any quick fix diets or fad diets can trigger increased levels of ghrelin and just keep stimulating this um, kind of appetite stimulant kind of um, reaction. Sleep also plays an important part in regulating these two hormones. Um, so we should always look at it, uh, improving our, our circadian rhythm. And your circadian rhythm is just like the natural cycle and flow of physical, mental and behavior changes. 
which our body goes through over a 24 hour cycle. So then we are onto the happy hormones. The, um, these are also neuro neurotransmitters, which are chemical messengers in the body. Dopamine is known as the feel good hormone and is an important part of our brain's reward system. It's associated with pleasurable experiences along with learning, memory, and motor system function. It can also be linked to repeated patterns of behavior. So, such as like we, we see ourselves kind of comfort eating at the end of a stressful day. You know, some people might find that when they're stressed, they eat a lot. And other people might find that they don't eat when they're stressed. Serotonin helps to regulate our mood as well as our sleep, our appetite, digestion, learning ability and memory. As well as being produced in the brain, it's also produced in the gut, which is really important too. So gut health is hugely important for us in midlife. A healthy gut environment can really help stabilize your mood, which can have a knock-on effect then on the cravings that you experience through, through, uh, during menopause. So like the cravings of sugar, of unhealthy fats, um, which the body then in turn will lay down as in estrogen producing abdominal fat. So it's kind of like this whole cycle of low, low estrogen and how it all kind of, it all becomes this little wheel and the cogs kind of just fallen off. Oxytocin is the love hormone. So oxytocin is known as the love hormone. It's essential for childbirth and breastfeeding and uh, creates a strong parent-child bonding. It also helps to promote trust and empathy, bonding in relationships, and oxytocin levels generally increase with physical affection, kissing, cuddling. It's also produced in the brain and the gut too. And endorphins then lastly, endorphins, these are our body's natural pain reliever. And the body produces in response to stress or discomfort. Endorphin levels also tend to increase when you engage in rewarding reward producing activities such as eating and exercising and having sex as well. Uh, with fluctuating levels of estrogen and testosterone, they can influence the levels of these hugely important hormones. So we can see why then we're kind of, it's, it is important to have all these hormones in balance with each other. So change in lifestyle patterns, moving on to that. Um, so I kind of broke this down into various different things. So stick to a, um, a regular bedtime schedule. We covered um, sleep in our second uh, masterclass last month. So there was a lot taken away from that. And if, um, if you haven't got that talk, the recording of it, we can send it on to you. That's no problem. But some of the just the, the simplest things are, you know, you exercise during the day and natural light to boost this circadian rhythm I was talking about. Keep the bedroom cool and dark so that your brain knows that this is kind of rest and digest. Um, disconnect from blue light devices. So, you know, the research is, is proven and shown that if you disconnect from, you know, your laptop to portable devices um, an hour before bedtime, that will help just create your mel or um, produce your melatonin to help you sleep. And I always just put this one in because this is my personal favorite. It's a game changer invest in a silk pillow, pillowcase because it's nice and cool all the time if you have if you particularly have night sweats. So reduce your stress. Um, we've spoken about stress already. Um, do activities which access the parasympathetic system. So this is the other system I was just had mentioned. So activities that kind of access that system would be meditation or mindfulness, anything with breathing where you're you know, doing that four square breathing. If Maureen is here with us tonight and she did that um, breathing pattern with us in the sleep talk, and it's hugely beneficial. Um, meditation, mindfulness, yoga, all these kind of breathing and, and Pilates as well. Um, they access the vagus nerve, they stimulate the vagus, vagus nerve, which then just sends the message to the brain that you're to just calm down and everything will be absolutely fine and keep breathing. People think it's just really not, you know, it's out there, but it actually does work. Um, alcohol, oh, love it, hate it, whatever your opinion is, it is a depressant. Um, and it, it does exasperate vasor, vasor motor symptoms. So vasor motor symptoms are your night sweats and your hot flushes. Um, it increases anxiety. So 
you know, have you ever noticed the day after, you know, a few glasses of wine that your anxiety is really, really heightened? It's really high in calories. It's full of sugar. Um, you know, our bodies don't like it, really. Um, and it's devoid of any nutrients. It impacts on your sleep. So, you know, studies have shown that uh, you don't do you don't do any REM at all when you have alcohol in your system. Now, when I say alcohol, one glass of wine is absolutely fine. But, you know, anything past two or three and your sleep is going to be seriously affected. And it, it, it does depend on the individual. It can take up to three days for it fully to leave your system, which is like absolutely amazing. And the other thing I found, which was it's totally amazing, is that it is obviously toxic to your body. So when you consume alcohol um, and, you know, you get the munchies, then you know, break out the crisps or the nuts or the cheese and the crackers or whatever it is uh, or the chocolate, you know, whatever that um, fix is, your body will prioritize getting rid of the alcohol first and then it will work on getting rid of and um, breaking down the whatever snacks you've had. So high sugar, high fat. You can see why, you know, the whole glucose thing, you become insulin resistant, all that goes on your abdominals. That is, it's, that's really a game changer for me. When I found out that I was like, oh my God, um, how it just, alcohol just is not, it's not our friend in midlife, unfortunately, when it's, dry, when it's consumed to excess. Um, so another lifestyle change, obviously, is looking at our nutrition. <clears throat> Eating a healthy diet can help to manage menopause symptoms. Calcium-rich foods are, are especially important for supporting our aching joints and our weakening bones. And again, here we go, introducing sugar, uh, or sorry, reducing sugar intake and eating low GI, so low glycemic uh, index foods can also help with anxiety and poor sleep and mood swings. Adding gut friendly fermented foods into our diet has also been shown to boost mood. So those are, I always think of them as the three Ks, kombucha, kefir and kimchi. Those are, you know, really good gut friendly fermented foods. And kefir actually, you can pick up in, I've seen it in Aldi, in most Aldis just as a drink. Um, but you'd want to be trying to get the one that is natural and not flavoured with passion fruit or anything like that, because obviously that's got sugars in it. Um, so just I take a shot of that in the morning. Those struggling with vasomotor symptoms can benefit from um, avoiding spicy foods. Like it's just, you know, can the list get worse? You know, it's all the things that we love. Um, research suggests that many menopausal women um, do not consume enough protein. Like protein is really, really important. Um, not only for our bones, but our muscles as well. Um, it, we can get protein from, you know, from plant, plant food as well. It doesn't have to just be from meat, but it is really important to try and up your protein and decrease your carbs in your diet. Um, so this brings me on to phytoestrogens and azoflavins. Um, these are estrogen-like compounds derived from plants, and they can be found in foods such as soy and flax seeds and lentils and oats. And there's some evidence that they can improve menopausal symptoms by, by mimicking estrogen. However, they don't work for all women. Um, they're quite pricey to buy. Um, and the risks of taking high doses as a supplement, so in other words, uh, you know, using it instead of like maybe oh, I'm going to do this rather than go on some HRT. Um, it, uh, you know, the you know, well, not side effects, but just the research is, show, is still unknown. Like, you, you know, too much of something is going to be bad for you. So it's never going to, what I want to say is it just is never going to reduce hormone replacement. Like, stopping yourself with flax seeds is going to give you a whole host of other problems. Um, that you know, if you're trying in the hope to reduce your menopause symptoms by increasing that. So brings you on to uh, my favorite Mediterranean style diet. Uh, a lot of research has been done on the benefits of this type of diet because it's rich in whole fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, oily fish, and lean protein. Um, so the protein bit really, and everything else, not only just helps you 
feel satisfied, but it, it satisfies your satiety as well. It improves your gut health and your mood. And it lowers your risk of heart disease, diabetes and cancer. And it's, it's been shown that women who followed this diet have found they experience less symptoms associated with the menopause as well. So exercise, my, my favorite. Um, so up there in the top uh, is just a cross section of an MRI of a young, healthy thigh, thigh muscle. Um, and then one that is aging. And so you can see how it's shrinking, um, which is not great for us. So a report published by the journal, the journal Circulation in the US looked at the role of exercise in improve, improving heart health in midlife. It found the optimal amount of exercise is four to five 30 minute sessions a week. On a routine which includes a mix of high and low intensity activities, such as strength and resistance training and at least one longer session of aerobic exercise, such as an hour of brisk walking or cycling, swimming or running, was thought to be the optimum for our health. Now, this might seem like quite a lot of exercise, and for some people that wouldn't be, that'd be fine, they wouldn't have a problem with it. But the key from this, the key message from this is just to aim to be active most days. So flexing your muscles. Um, we're all well familiar with the benefits of cardiovascular exercise but strength and resistance, resistance training is more often than not neglected. And, you know, Maureen, as I said, um, Maureen O'Dwyer, who has hosted the previous two talks, she's here tonight and she's gonna be doing in the Q and A with us. Both Maureen and I love lifting heavy weight. We just love lifting heavy metal off a floor. Um, but that's not everybody's thing. It's not anybody, everyone's gig and sometimes you know, it is very daunting and can be intimidating to go into a gym with a load of bros in there and, you know, you don't know what to do and you don't know how to do it. And so the good news is you don't have to go to the gym if you don't want to. Um, but the benefits in this form of training in midlife are fantastic uh, because it builds up this um, muscle loss that you're experiencing. And with that, then you've got increased metabolism. So you burn more calories and happy days. Um, it protects, most importantly, though, against osteoporosis. Um, and with the loss of estrogen, there is a greater risk of this disease. It is estimated that over 300,000 people uh, have osteoporosis in Ireland. It's quite, when I went onto their site, I was quite shocked by that. And this was even shock, more shocking. Seven out of 10 hip fractures happen to women in Ireland. Seven out of 10, that is huge. Um, some women can lose up to 30% of the overall bone in their bodies when they are going through menopause. Like it's just absolutely shocking. So there we all are on our reformers. Um, so the benefits of reformer Pilates. So if, if lifting heavy weights uh, is not your thing, um, we teach uh, reformer Pilates. So it is a form of resistance exercise. Um, and the benefits of it um, are huge. Um, it is, it leads to greater strength and flexibility and balance. It improves your posture, your movement and your mobility. It's also a full body workout. So you're working absolutely every muscle in your body. And it always uh, it fascinates me and it surprises people when I'll say, okay, we're gonna do whatever exercise it's, you know, and it's, they're working their hands with straps. Um, so they're being challenged with their muscles and they, you know, and then they're saying, saying, God, I felt that in my core as well. And I said, of course you are, because you're kneeling on this moving object and you have to be able to stabilize your core uh, in order for you not to fall off the machine. So, you know, every single thing is getting worked. So it tones your muscles, makes them long and lean. I know some women think that by doing resistance training or strength training that you're going to have big bulky muscles, but um, given the fact that we're losing our testosterone as well, um, you're never you're never going to bulk up with big muscles um, unless you take anabolic steroids. So it, the reformer creates nice, long, lean muscles and also a stronger core, which is hugely important for your back. Um, we can make it as, as high intensity, but it's generally low impact on your joints. And it's just 
a brilliant form for of exercise for injury, injury prevention and rehabilitation as well. So I also decided to put this in, NEAT. Um, I don't know if many of you know about this. It's not a phenomenon, it's a real thing. And it's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Um, so in short, NEAT. Uh, it's the energy that's expended for everything we do that is not sleeping, eating or exercising. So it's, uh, well, it happened here. So it's anything from walking to work, typing, performing yard work, gardening, housework, uh, ironing, hoovering, and I put in there, yeah, fidgeting as well. You know, have you ever noticed someone who's like a fidgeter? They're like really a real fidgeter. They're generally very, you know, they've got a lot of energy. They're always on the move. So where to from here? Well, my thought for the evening is to start off with accepting the changes that are going on in our bodies and in our body composition. I know it's, it's a hard thing, but I think, you know, if you can accept where you're at right now, um, that's half the battle, really. Because despising the body we are in is never going to feel, you're never going to feel good. And any improvements that come from this come from a place of loathing and punishment and restriction. And you're going to feel hard done by and, you know, they're unlikely to last them. And it will only contribute to poor mental health and low self-esteem. So losing weight and keeping it off requires permanent and sustainable change. It's just not about a diet anymore, which is obviously culturally how we've approached this problem. You know, you need to lose weight, go on a diet. We need to view it more as a behavior change and not a diet or a punishment. And, there's, and there is no doubt that it is a challenge. You're challenging patterns and behaviors that have gone on forever. So it requires discipline and focus. Um, but it's absolutely, it's not impossible. It may require the report of a, the support of a partner or a coach or counsellor or an exercise buddy to keep, you, to keep you accountable. So in ending all this, if you'd like support in this area, please do contact us as we have developed a wellbeing programme to support all these changes. It's important to embrace these wonderful bodies we have been given. They've got us to midlife now and they have the task to take us beyond. Thank you very much. At the very end, I've given all my resources um, just from books to websites, to social media, to podcasts. Um, the, some of you have come in for the first time. If you haven't downloaded Louise Newson's Balance app, it's free. I would do that and just start just tracking your symptoms in the symptom checker. Um, and just feel. Um, so now I am going to stop sharing. Yeah, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, and Maureen is here as well. So if we unmute Maureen, can you unmute Maureen? Yeah. Yep. Oh, you're muted. Welcome, welcome, yes, Maureen. I'm muted. So this Thank is Maureen you, O'Dwyer Alex. from. Highfield Healthcare and um, myself and Maureen's paths crossed oh beginning of December last year where I went uh, to Highfield to, to, to do their program um, on anxiety and depression and I was my first meeting with Maureen we were just having the chats and she said you know do you ever think you might be perimenopausal and I went oh my god yeah I went to my doctor though in September and my blood tests and she said I'm fine and I didn't believe her and and from that has just morphed into this wonderful friendship that now we're, we're down to the third talk on uh, perimenopause and menopause symptoms and um, she's just the go-to person on all this sort of stuff so I, mean, I love having Maureen here with us tonight. Um, so Maureen, you were having a look at the chat to see if there were any questions. Had come yeah, through. Um, and it was just about the three Ks, the mm. kombucha, kimchi, and um, kefir. Yeah. But um, that talk was brilliant, Karen, and thank you so much. I must say one thing um, that I notice, in, especially in my work, and actually with a couple even of my clients today, 
um, tend to be, can be very busy women and they don't eat all day or they might just grab a scone for lunch and then come home in the evening. One, one of my clients today described to me, she's a teacher, busy all day. She says, I literally don't have time to eat. I might have half a sandwich at lunchtime, that's it. Comes home, gets the dinner, the kids ready. And then she said she sits down and eats from about half eight to half nine and then goes to bed about half 10 and can't sleep. So she's starting to join the dots up now and realizing, first of all, the blood sugars are all over the place. Secondly, eating so close to bedtime, she's not giving her microbiome any time to rest and sleep. Then it's impacting her the next day as well. She's also perimenopausal and she's heading off to the menopause hub in a couple of weeks as well. So it's kind of, sometimes we have to just kind of talk and look and track and see, generally speaking, it's, you know, what we do throughout the day. There's no one particular time. So that would be the piece as well, especially when you talk about the gut mm. with Karen. That's really, really, really important. Mm. Um, and there's lots of research and links now down in Cork and university. They're doing fantastic research into the role of the gut um, and mental health and production of serotonin. So I myself, what I do is I generally, I just let my microbiome rest for 12 hours. So I would eat, you know, I usually have my breakfast at eight and then I finish eating at night by eight. And then because you, you're, the microbiome, they're little bugs in your belly and they need to rest too, they get tired. So that's what I do. And then I just eat what I want during the day. But because I suppose um, I eat what I want, but I like, I like um, healthy stuff, so that's okay. But don't get me wrong, I do drink the odd gin and <laughs> eat the odd, the odd thing here, pizza. Actually, since lockdown started, I've eaten more pizza than I have in my whole entire life. But, uh, hopefully that's the only one. You wouldn't be the only one. I want to I want to come in there just um, before we move on about um, just eating late at night. So when you do eat late at night um, and like myself and Eleanor would be victims of that. If, we're, if, if we come in, we, we, we would have our dinner after we've taught classes. But and now I know why you're wired. So when you eat when you eat late at night, it stops your production of melatonin to kind of wind yeah. you down and make you tired. So yeah, you're, that's what it is, Elner. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. Um, Gemma, uh, hey Gemma. Um, Gemma has a question here. Um, from, from what I've heard on Joe Duffy during the week, there's no menopause clinic in Ireland. Do you know if this is the case? Um, there is. There's the menopause hub in Stolorgan. There is a new clinic in Dawkey called the Menopause Health Clinic. There's one in um, Dr. Deirdre Lundy in Bray, and then there's another one with Dr. Deirdre Ford down in Athlone, La Kayla family practice, I think, or something like but, that. Yeah, but I think as well, um, following all the information and everything, I think GPs now will be upping their game and will be, you know, because it's quite, it's not that complicated, really. And even Dr. Louise Newsom, you know, says that prescribing HRT is one of the simplest things you can do. So um, hopefully then there'll be GPs will, will update their knowledge. There's some excellent one that's out there and then there's some that haven't updated their knowledge. So I think there'll be more services. I know even two and a half years ago, I had a, it was a two month wait for the menopause hub. That was two and a half years ago. So um, it's woeful. Yeah, menopause yeah. care here is woeful. So. Yeah, there's a comment here from um, from Joan just saying about that it's over that the system, you know, the clinics that are here have been overloaded. And yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I waited for two months for my appointment as well. So I can only imagine now after a week of Joe Duffy's uh, program, the waiting list will be even further along. Um, there is a question here. Is eating too much fruit bad for mm. you? Um, yeah. What's your take on that, Maureen? 
Oh yeah, well it's the the sugar thing. Actually, mm. that that happened. My brother, he uh, my brother was um, gaining weight, and then I got him to do a food diary. Um, I trained as a personal trainer and and did all that sort of stuff um, a few years ago as well. And he was eating seven pieces of fruit a day. So he, um, yeah, because there's, there's, it's good for you, but there's the natural sugar. So like anything, like sugar isn't bad for you. Excess sugar is. Fruit isn't. Excess fruit is. Wine even, you know, excess. Yeah. Would you agree, Karen? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it does it does have an impact on your gut health as well. If you're, you know, because it's, it ferments as well, you know, it is fruit. Um, mm. Somebody has asked where, where they can source the three Ks. So the, the kimchi, kombucha and kefir. Um, I'd say the best, well, the, you can see them in, the kombucha is quite widely available in, um, in any sort of shop. Um, in their drinks, just like soft drinks section. I just watch out for the sugars that are in it though. Um, Super Value have a really good selection um, of all of them um, mm. just in, in their small little fridge of kind of artisan food. Um, and yeah, I have noticed that the kefir is everywhere as well. It's in Tesco too. But I did notice this in, if you're a shopper in Aldi, that it's there as well. Um, mm. um, Colette said there's a doctor in River Forest in Leeds Lip. Specialising in menopause. That's brilliant. Oh, brilliant. That's fantastic. Mm. Mm. <laughs> nice one, Gail. <laughs> Our colleague Gail is just saying that she's completely ignoring that alcohol is not her friend. <laughs> um, <laughs> what will be a healthy low fat snack to graze on? I need to think. Okay, so. I I wouldn't be a fan of snacking really, much to my daughter's disgust. Um, I I used to I used to do it a lot, but um, well, when I say a lot, I would have a snack in the morning and then in the afternoon. Um, but from all, I mean, obviously I'm not moving as much as well, so I am trying to work look at that sort of like calorie intake. But you're better off to try and not snack. Just have three decent meals a day because you want to try at our stage in life you want to try and keep that blood sugar at a quite an even keel so if you start to kind of have a snack in between meals it's going to have this spike again and then you're going to come back down again so um so nuts probably I make no sugar go on more yeah could i make a suggestion yeah one thing I do, and I'd say some of you do it already, is frozen grapes. Frozen grapes are, are brilliant because um, it's the whole sensory thing and tricking your brain that you're eating something like the coldness, you have that sensory piece, the sweetness, the chewiness. Um, so frozen grapes are um, really good. And you're not going to eat too many frozen grapes because actually about 15 grapes is equivalent to as much sugar as a donut. But, you know, if you're eating four or five over the, the, the evening or just, you know, stacking on a few, they're fine. Yeah, I would agree with that, with the, with the snacking as well. Or have a, like, have a decaf coffee or like a ginger tea or, or something instead if you can. Yeah. Um, but it's if not, tea. with snacking, it's recommended to have protein. So, you know, a couple of slices of apple with peanut butter. Or, mm. you know, you'd have a bit of fruit with a little bit of cheese because protein is going to keep you fuller for longer. Yeah, yeah. Um, Emer is wondering, she's saying, I'm hearing a lot about a healthy gut. Uh, what would you recommend to promote a healthy gut? So definitely, you know, fermented food. So anything like, you know, kimchi is basically a fermented cabbage um, and kombucha is fermented as well. So... Um, anything that well anything that was put in the was said about a Mediterranean diet so you're just looking at you know low sugar basically promotes a healthy mm -hmm. gut and resting your microbiome so if you go to Liz Earl is fantastic for all this information about healthy gut and it really does come down to the three K's 
resting your microbiome. She does the same. The ideal is 14 hours, but I can't do yeah. 14 hours. Uh, but 12 is fine. Um, so they, that's really the main things. And then you'll wake up the next morning and you, you know, your, your, your tummy will feel fine. Your digestive system has time to rest. And you can, you know, enjoy your coffee or whatever in the morning and your whatever else you have. So that would be the main thing. But Liz Earle is, is really good on. on yeah, and she's, she's written a book. Quite on, simple. Yeah, and she's written a book on gut health, um, mm. which I didn't put in the resources. But there is one um, I did, uh, The Clever Gut Diet. Um, when I, well, two years ago, I went to see my doctor with with symptoms but really it was my long journey to actually getting a diagnosis so she said I had um basically a candida in, in my gut because I had had too many antibiotics for a sinus infection I didn't have ever um it was migraines but um she so I got this book anyway just to see about how I just clear out and make, make my gut a little bit healthier. And yeah, it was fascinating. So um, the name of the book and the author is in the resources. So at the end of this presentation, which we can send to everybody. Um, what else? Is there another one? No. No, no more questions. No. No. Any parting thoughts, Maureen? Just in case somebody does want to get a question in. I suppose it's that really in midlife, like you say, we are, we are changing, we are transitioning. What you resist persists. So it's about educating yourself, learning more about this time of life that in fact, we need less carbohydrates because that's energy because we're not expending as much energy yeah. and we need more kind of um, protein and more um, food that's going to kind of sustain us and, and keep us keep us full and keep us well. Um, I was always strict vegetarian till I turned 40 and then I just like, I just had to eat fish. And then when I was about 45, I started eating chicken. I was just like, I couldn't, I just had to. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think I was just going with with naturally what my body was looking for. Um, mm. Yeah, and keeping up. Obviously, Karen and I love the weight training, and I mean, I've been doing it for twenty six years. But um, any sort of resistance work is important because one of the main reasons I do it is so to prevent. Or if I do fall when I'm eighty, I can get myself back up off the ground again. I'm not going to break my hip. Hopefully, things like that. I just, as I, I do a group and work called what, what gifts can you give your future self? So even think of this today, like what gifts can you give your future self? Mm. That's really good. Yeah, I really like that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, this is a really hard, it's a hard, uh, hard time to be going through, you know. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I like that resistance bit you were saying Maureen I think the main thing though is just to be compassionate just show yourself some compassion um you know that's not giving yourself the the excuse just to go you know off the rails but to kind of just go easy on yourself and be good to yourself um that you are going through a huge change and um it's to acknowledge that um and you know an 80 20 rule that is uh, that is how mm. I operate my um yeah. <laughs> Eleanor with her thumbs up I operate an 80 20 rule so it's kind of you know it's not all bets are off at the weekend but you know no. I'll have I'll have a bit of whatever I like at the weekend um and still keep active and you know do my pilates so that is thank you very much bring back to your head <laughs> Yes, Eva. Yes. <laughs> as soon as the pox goes. Yeah, if we could only just get a class back, <laughs> our wonderful clients on reformers, we would be delighted uh, to introduce TRX as well. So TRX, yeah, for sure, is a great form of um, resistance training as well. 
So we're going to wrap it up, uh, ladies. Um, but thank you all so much for spending your Thursday evening listening to listening to me and to Maureen and to Eleanor. Um, I look forward to seeing all the clients back um, when we can, hopefully, uh, in the in the near future. And yeah, I would love to see some of the some new faces as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's. That's all that's me.